What's your guys' biggest? Who? How many? Everybody in here races dirt late models or what? Who? Who does? Who races modifieds? Okay. Who races dirt late models? Okay. What's your single biggest problem that you have with your dirt late model? You can't get it to turn. Is that it? So, so what are you doing? What would it be set up, and how are you trying to fix it? And what chassis is it? It's a laser. It's an older laser. Uh, we've been through a variety of issues with it, including uh, spring rates on the right front corner, and uh, making sure that the initial setup that was on the car, we were actually hit the one line and kind of watching the front end. We got that fixed, and I think. So right rear load is your, we'll talk about rear a little bit, but let's talk about your front. So were you running single spring stack, stack of the bump? Stack, stack of the bump. Okay. Um, and were you were, said you were coil binding it for a while? Initially, yeah. Yeah, that's a no-no. Springs aren't happy when you coil bind. I don't care what anybody tells you. You're going to kill it. And the problem is, is what happens is, and Bubba can explain it a little bit because he explains it better than I do, is when you coil bind that, that, that right front, you basketball the tire. So maybe Bubba can want to talk about the contact patch and how that looks and, and what we see. Yeah, I mean, the load distributed in the front suspension is mainly to create the slip angle of the tire. When, the, when you don't create the correct slip angle, whether you bounce the tire or you overload or underload it, what that tire is, the grip. And that controls how it turns. So the key to all of it is what we do to that slip angle to make the car turn. So, like I said, coil bind sometime, it'll spike off of it, and that shear rate from coming off coal bind, the knot spikes that slip angle, and then it's hard to control what that patch does. Right, right. When we first started having the theory, you know, we started looking at dynamics and come with the machines, what, 15 years ago. Um, my theory and a, a lot of guys went off my theories because no one had ever looked at it the way I did. But my theory was to be into the bump or be into the secondary spring as much as the tire compressed. So you stayed at a, a simple linear rate instead of spiking it as much as the tire compressed. If that tire compressed three quarters of an inch or one inch, I felt like you needed to be aggressive the whole time you're into the compression of the tire. Other questions? Can you run rubbers? Uh, no, no rubbers. Right eye rule. You have a right eye rule or no right eye rule? What, what do you mean? Chassis wise, you have a right eye rule in the class. So they're not they're not checking deck heights prior to rolling on the racetrack. The checking deck heights on the left rear, and I don't mean, yeah, not on the right front. Okay. You know, chassis so where do they check it at full droop? Static? What? So a lot of my, probably 602, 602 non-adjustable stuff there. A lot of my guys, if they do have a deck height rule, what we'll do is we'll run a very tall soft spring and try to make sure that when that thing compresses, we still, like my cars want 2,200 pounds of full travel. So we'll just keep changing the spring rate and making the preload match when we get to 2,200 pounds essentially of full travel. That's what kind of how we work all that out. Um, if you don't have a deck height rule, then we just put a very stiff spring in the right front and keep lowering the corner until we see 2,200 pounds on the smasher as well. Now the car looks goofy, it rides through the pits all contorted, looks like it's in attitude, but that's the easiest way to do that with no bumps or, or no stops. Yeah, one of the biggest things that we see is guys are, how many guys in here still scale their car every week? Okay, you guys use smashers to check loads or what? 
Okay. You got to live in the smasher. Don't worry about what the car looks like going through the pit. Worry about what it looks like on the racetrack and how it performs and where your travel is. We've learned even in like the pavement market, for example, the taller the spring, the lighter the spring, the more load you put in it, the happier the spring is. Go into a, a shorter spring with trying to put the same load into it, unless you're in a situation like Mike just explained, it, it doesn't work as well. You, you're, you're really limiting the ability of the spring. Remember something. It's, it's really simple to me, and, but I look at things at a different light. Warrior builds an amazing chassis. That chassis is the biggest spring in the car. It's got a spring rate to it. Bubba can tell you a story about what he did with Scott Bloomquist with two identical cars. So that's your spring rate. That's your, the biggest spring in the car. That chassis, I call it an articulation device because the job of that chassis is it's going to move and it's going to distribute the load to all the tires. Key word, tires. It's the only thing touching the racetrack. The next most, imp I think one of the most important things on the race car that over look, gets overlooked is your spring package. Everything on that race car has to go through the spring. Has to. Okay? The job of the shock is not to be a spring. The job of the shock is to be the brains of the spring and tell the spring when I want it to go down, how fast I want it to go down, or if I want it to keep it down or come back up. If you're using the shock as a spring, you've limited what you can do because the racetrack is changing and your shock isn't. So pay attention to what your springs look like in the car. If they're contorted, they're not straight, they're not happy. If they're not happy, your race car isn't going to be happy. So I'd go taller, lighter, and just get, keep get, putting the load into it. The spring's going to like it. And the other thing is um, use bearings in it, TRBs. Bearing, I don't know what Mike's theory is. Bubba's is two, mine is one. And the only reason I say one is because... I know dirt racers are lazy and we don't like to clean a lot of crap, so that means you only got to clean one instead of two. But two is is probably a better way to go. Yeah, and on top of that too, like you were saying, pretty much like the way I teach my customers, we're just going to keep cranking preload in that top spring until we get whatever your manufacturer says at the bottom. But also too, like you talked about shocks, you're going to have to make sure that your shock matches the spring rate that you're going to try to run. Because if I got a guy from a gigantic 350 right front on a lowered ride height, we're going to have more rebound to control of that thing versus him putting a 200 pound or 175 in the right front, winding it up just to get his load numbers. So that's another thing you have to worry about too is the balance of the rebound on the right front trying to do that. Yeah, just to touch in one thing about, we'll get you in a second. Um, we talk about the bearings, Frank touched in on the bearings, a lot of people, that spring, when that spring compresses to maintain its rate, it, that spring has to unwind itself to complete the rate. If that spring don't unwind, that rate gets stiffer. So to unwrap that spring, that length of that spring has to unwind to maintain the rate. Especially when you're seeing 10, 15 inch spikes on the racetrack, that spring will get awful stiff if it binds itself up. Uh, all of a sudden it's creating more rate than what you really realize, especially in a rough track with a lot of spikes. You're talking about torrents and barons? Yeah, yes, torrents. Yeah. Yes, sir. So from, from our guys, I mean, we, we run Swiss Springs, so that's all they offer. They don't offer any kind of closed coil, straight. They offer a nice barrel spring, so that's all we put on our cars. That's kind of what we suggest to everybody. I mean, all the brands make a barrel-style spring. These guys here, they make one that's a barrel, and it don't bow, and, and it does the best job. Um, of course, the lighter the spring, the taller it's going to get. These guys make springs that are different shapes to keep them from bowing. They've definitely got the best consistency out of that. Yeah, we'll build, because of the pavement market, we'll build different series and styles of springs. We'll build springs that, when you start running really high loads, we like to go to a bigger spring. And I know in IMCA there's rules and there's limitations, but um, we'll build trees that look like Christmas trees. We build springs that are five inch, we build springs that are three and a half ID, and we build barrel springs that are two and a half. Tell the thing I tell people to watch, and this is where bearings are really critical is, when you have a barrel spring and you put a soft spring in there and you wind it up, if you wind it up without bearings in it, you're going to contort the barrel, the first, the first, I call it the hook, the top and the bottom. And when you contort that, it starts to push uh, unwanted load into the spring and tries to twist the spring. 
So when it twists the springs, it's adding load. And like Bubba said, when the first time you go through a bump, it's going to change. I was playing with something on a smasher at a show, and I didn't have bearings there, and I had to go get some. <clears throat> when I was playing with it, I took a uh, 10-inch, 80-pound spring, and I made it look like a freaking pretzel because there was no bearings in it to unload it. And I was putting 450 pounds of load into an 80 pound spring. And it was for a dirt car application. It was a stack. So you got to keep the spring free and linear. Otherwise, everything that you try to do, and, and the problem that we see the most is, and Mike does shocks, he knows it, and is that if you keep your springs on the car fresh, he can build you a better shock absorber. And his chassis is going to work better. And you're not going to have as many, you know, headaches because it's working the way it's supposed to work. All right, uh, these guys are reminding me back here. They want you to use the microphone, but I think we could probably get away with it if we just talk louder on the questions. And I'll just reiterate the question back to everybody once we ask it. I, I want to just say one thing, too. Um, a lot of guys think that that dynamic load in the right front is where it's at, dead in the center of the corner on some tracks. 99% of the time, uh, that max travel load that you see in the right front is when you lift getting in the corner before you even start down in the corner. That is your max, usually. So that area that you work on in that three quarter up, that particular area you're working on there is a lot to do with the middle of the corner, not just that down static number that uh, dynamic load most time is not there the left side of the car is in rise most of the way around the racetrack except a little bit it really doesn't go into compression much uh and the and like i said the right side will go in compression but it's not quite just everybody's like oh dead in the middle of the corner that's the problem max load max load that's really not what you're looking for right there as much how I many of you guys run travel indicators all the time? One, two, three, four. All right, so we got like 70 people in here. You got to be running travel indicators on, on all the corners that you can. And uh, something that we'll do, like I get guys, like we run data acquisition a lot. I know Bubba does all the time. I try to run as much as possible. We can see where the max load does come in at and where it rides at. Um, just a little old school trick that we found out, just paint the indicator rod. And where that thing is rubbed off at the most is where that car actually rides at. And like Bubba's saying, you think your max load is in the center, but your max load is really upon entry, and then you might ride up another half inch above that. So then as we was telling this gentleman to, to do his max travel load on the right front, he may be trying to focus in the center, but really his max load's on entry, and then he's another 200 pounds less in the center. And you can do that by your indicator rod. So that's something you really need to be running some travel indicators on all your corners. The other thing that's a real easy trick, if you don't have time to get travel indicator rods and you think it's a hassle because some guys, if you go through a hole, it's going to change it. But like Mike said, if you paint it, you can see it. Get yourself a black Sharpie, one of the big wide ones, okay? And just take it, wipe your shaft off and just mark your shaft with the black, okay? When you go out and do your hot laps and you come back in, that thing is, it's going to wear the black off the area that it's traveled to. So you're going to know where your travel's at. Real simple, easy way. Don't have to go out and spend a lot of money. Yeah, you got to go buy a Sharpie. Okay? But you're going to be able to see it, and you're going to know what it's at. So now, when you know where your max travel's at, and you guys all said you had smashers, now you can put that on there. Bubba's son, Kale, has done a lot of data on cars, and it's really amazing to us to see how many things people think are happening that really aren't happening. And so uh, there's a lot of myths out there because we all say, oh, it's got to be doing this. And we learn every day based on that, the fact that it, that's not the truth. All right. I'm going to Q&A Mike right here for a minute. Just, just the way y'all can get an idea. All right. When you go to the, the racetrack, Mike, your first thing that you're looking at, you know, your first practice, you're looking at your shock travels, what is your number one you look at air pressure, what do you look at to start judging your car on what you want it to do? I'm kind of old school, so yeah, air pressure is one of them. Yes. Air pressure is huge. Air pressure will tell you what your race car is doing, no matter what. It's not a lie. No matter what your driver says, anything, air pressure tells you what your race car is doing. Yeah, I, I know for us asphalt guys, you know, a tire barometer, but the dirt guys doesn't use that much. So you're looking at your, 
your travel on the, are you talking to your driver about how much steer input he's got in, the way you can judge how much rear steer you think you're oversteering or not? Do you, is that one of the things you look for too, oversteer, understeer, yeah, as so, far as the rear? So like my main question kind of when we come in is like, how does it steer in the corner? Are you putting a lot of wheel into it to get it in the corner or are you having to catch it in the center of the corner? And then, then we can kind of make our judgments on adjustments from there. Um, like I said, I'm really looking at like right front travel, right rear travel. Left rear always gets to where it's going to go no matter what's happening. So, you know, let's just say the car felt like it, it was a little bit loose in. Would you go to uh, left rear extended load as an adjustment to start with or what would be one of your number one adjustments? Move a rod or what? First on my master driver is that on throttle or off the throttle. Right, okay. Then we got to break it down that way. That's where all this gets tricky. Like, I try to teach all my customers and they call me. They got to break down each part of the corner on throttle or off a, throttle. B, C, well. D, yeah. yeah. There's more than just I drove it in the corner and it's loose. Like, I got to know did you dump the fuel? Did you yank the wheel? Right. You know, are you on the throttle? So, say we're on the throttle and we're loose, probably just going to put some spring rubbers in the right rear because mm -hmm. the car's not falling down to get into the rate it needs to. So, you only increase the rate where that to. And it doesn't have to roll as much to have the rate on the tire. Yep. And then if we're off throttle, probably just going to take some rounds out of the right rear and let the thing settle down and get the rod angles where they need to be on entry. And, and then maybe put a rubber in as well. Okay. Anybody got a question for him on something like that? All right, so the question is, uh, what are we checking on air pressure? What are we looking for? So, got to get a good air pressure gauge, something that reads like zero to 20. That way you can do increments of at least one. Um, and you're just looking to see if it gained, what corner gained. If your right rear gained, that means it's scooting across the racetrack and it's not getting grip. If your left rear, if it gained more than your left rear, so that means you're free on entry. If your right front gained, it means it's scooting across the racetrack. We're looking for air pressure gains. Most of us dirt guys, we don't have a, like a parameter like the asphalt guys would use. Most of us run around with temperature guns, that just cheap $20 temperature guns, just checking the, each one. So a lot of guys are hardcore on checking temperatures and see middle, center, outside, and we can really see if the tire's rolling under a lot when we're doing that or not. Um, that may just tell you to go up on air pressure. Not so much like if the car's loose or free or what's going on. I mean, it can tell you, you know, if your right rear is hotter than your left rear, then obviously that way. But a lot of us just look at air pressure gains. Okay, so what do you expect is a good gain? <coughs> you know, uh, typical, like a, pound, like a pound all the way around would be good. I mean, the left front doesn't grow as much. The right front might be about a half a pound. The rears will grow about a pound equally. Be fine. Over a long race, you might see two to three pounds. But if the car is free, your right rear might go up three to four pounds. And that's like I said, it's not, it's an easy way for you to check everything before the driver digresses with you and you can kind of see where he's headed information wise and kind of already know where you need to go. Somebody back there had a question. Gentleman, black shirt with a silver hair in the back. I thought I saw you had your hand up. No? <laughs> Just waving, right? <laughs> So you're saying you, you run a lot of static toe so it generates heat to heat the tire up. No groove, no sop rule? Correct. Okay. That could be something you could do if you're on a no groove, no sop rule. You could kind of trick it that way. As long as the front end geometry is built to not go crazy bump out when it gets to full travel. Wouldn't you agree, Bob? Yeah. That's and tricky there. Like I said, you do see a lot of guys bumping out a little bit, but too much kind of thing can be just really hard to catch up the rest of the chassis to it yeah i, I done a video the other day on the uh, race know-how a lot of people see me on there and we've done one on bump and ackerman and stuff like that and i kind of walk you through like we build our cars a certain way on the front end geometry and the bump is set a certain way so when it gets down it's not all over the place and it ends up where it be so if you just start adding toe to one of my cars it's going to change the bump out at full travel so Maybe if one of my customers approached me with that, we'd figure out how to get the bump steer correct and then use that as a tool. I mean, that's something I've, I've not heard of really is running a lot of toe to create tire heat because we're not really dragging the tires down the straightaway. All of our cars are now built to when we're in dynamic attitude, all of our wheels are in a line, no matter if they're towed out or not. 
Does everybody? I'm sorry. Go ahead. So, like I taught in the video the other day, typical toe is anywhere between three quarter, and some guys run up to an inch and a quarter. Some manufacturers do, but then they may not bump out as much at the end. My stuff starts at three quarter, and when we're fully towed out, like full bump, we're an inch. So, uh, some of he's bumping out two fifty. Yeah, we're bumping out two fifty from start to finish. Um, some old school guys think you want to run a half. Um, makes the cars kind of darty now when they're at a half because the front end just doesn't, it don't tow out enough and be stable. Uh, so, go. I come from road racing, okay, that kind of tow was like way out of scope, right? Um, and bump steer, we minimize bump steer, right? We kind of so when you're looking for, for bump steer in the corner, are you just trying to help the tire stay in the line with the back of yeah our tires that we run if you've come from road racing you definitely understand this and like um our tires are big balloons they wall are all over the place they move they squish they create a lot of issues for all of us bubba comes from asphalt racing where they probably don't move a whole lot right yeah let me just throw this at you right here just while i got it i kind of think one of the deals why the dirt cars find the toe out on the right front is because you stay steered into it and it really doesn't if you think about it the right front tires the slip angles not getting pushed in like an asphalt car christmas trees to the inside a dirt car you kind of got rear steer you're leading you're turning to the right a lot so i think you tow it out and a little bit of advantage of why they keep it towed is it pulls the slip angle and you really don't turn it and come back across and move the slip angle of the tire across the rim again. So then I, I think if you have to do that, then it's hard to correct the car. So the toe out keeps the slip angle pulled to the right because you're steered right. It kind of keeps that slip angle from tucking and moving back again. Right. Does everybody in here understand what bump, bump is? Who, who doesn't know what bump is? Everybody knows what bump steer is. Come on, don't be ashamed. Right. We're in here to teach. Like right. we're not. We're gonna make explain no bump steer to me right there. There we go. <laughs> He's gonna explain bump steer to us. Hang on. We're gonna start picking on y'all in a minute. Y'all don't start answering the right questions. <laughs> bump steer is how far your front end toes in and out during motion on the front end. Correct. Give him his, you know, we got stars up here. What we got going on? my water bottle. <laughs> yep. <laughs> a gentleman right. in a red shirt. I know what bumps here is, but are you talking like just the right front bumps out? An inch going in? So on my cars. Uh, yeah, so on, on my stuff, the way I set it up is the left, our left front travels up and down so far. If it moves any direction, when the car lands on entry, that's gonna pull the car, whatever direction that tire's pointed. So our left fronts, will try to run zero as much as possible. Now, when we talk, a lot of us dirt guys, when we talk bump, it's just mainly on the right front because we don't want the left front to control the direction of the car. Um, I actually designed a new car a couple of years ago and I screwed the left front up and we tested. Driver keeps coming in and you can see the car wiggle, but he couldn't like say, hey, this is what it was. So put an older guy in it, comes in, he's like, man, your bump steer is just totally screwed up. Went back to the shop, that left front was pointed out when it landed and it dragged the car around. So. Yeah, it's mainly all right front when we talk about bump steering the dirt market. Anybody got any questions? Caster, camber, like uh, this little sheet right here, we're not trying to live and die by it, but it's kind of something to get us all spurred up. Bumping out. Yeah, you, can, you could say that you're towing out the left if right front is predominant because it's the most loaded tire. Well, 
Well, basically what, you know, when you send her the steering up, you send her the rack up or a steering box, basically he's picking towing out alignment of the steering to start with, that tire moves in relation to the box or the rack. The toe is actually in the right front. But I do understand what you're trying to say, but basically in terminology, it, you know, the steer is to the right or left based on where your steering is set. Right. Yeah, now there are some guys that will run a lot of toe and have it in their brain that when they do turn left, it cuts the left front tire a little quicker, but I think those guys are understand what Ackerman does in the front end, so they'll just yank a lot of toe in it and think when they turn left, the left front tire now sticks out and it'll help them cut. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. I think some guys don't understand what the Ackerman is, which is the length of the steering arm. And I think they just try to crank a lot of toe in it and hoping that, when, like you're saying, when you do turn left, it shoots the left front tire out and pulls the car down the hill faster. So I, exactly, yeah. But like I so said, our cars are, we all, all of us manufacturers have really got hard on when the car's in attitude, that all of our four tires are almost running the same direction. Um, I know it's hard to think because our bodies look so contorted and all that, but really our contact patches are running straight down the straightaway. I'm going to leave that on Bubba. He's we on well, the front ends than I am. I mean, the dirt car stuff, really, the left front's just kind of up and catches it, really. It doesn't, you doesn't steer off the left front tire a whole bunch on one of those cars. You know, most of the, you hear those drivers get out, you know, I needed to drive off the right front harder. You know, I want to drive off the right front. Some drivers, they want to drive off the right rear. And this dirt stuff, you know, the guy's like, hey, so their feel is basically a lot off what that right front tire does, the feel they got for the car. So, you know, be like, make, make it drive off the right front where I can feel the car better. Yes, you know, go ahead. I was going to say that I've been at the track with Bubba, and uh, he's worked a lot with Scott Bloomquist over the years, and, and we were at Charlotte two years ago, and <laughs> Bubba's looking at his car and goes, that thing drives like a toilet going around the track. And he goes to Scott, and he goes, you check your, your steering alignment. And he goes, what do you mean? He goes, front to rear, on the right side. Is the, is the right front and the right rear in the same tracking plane in and out? It's, it's huge to what it does with the car. You have to have those wheels lined up in conjunction with each other to be able to really drive the car forward and let it turn. Yeah, and that, that's what Michael's kind of been saying. You know, in dynamics, the, the four tires line up way closer than what you think when it, the car's all in attitude. Yeah, we really work hard on that. Um, I was going to say to your question about the Ackerman stuff, on my cars, I have adjustable spindles. My drivers can go back and forth. Uh, pretty much the dirt market is just shortening the left front to help on short tracks. If they go on big tracks, they'll just keep steering arms as long as possible for sh just smoothness because, like, like he's saying, all of our weight is on the right front tire the majority of the time. So if you really get your – your Ackerman way off, it just gets tricky too. It's like the toes messed up essentially. So we'll just run long steering arms on big tracks and then go to a little place, three eighths mile, quarter mile, whatever, and got to run the bottom. We'll just shorten the left front steering arm up so it does help cut the car into the corner. But like Bob was saying, like our left fronts, they're, they're, in, they're in dynamic droop out most of the time. So like our cars don't turn off the left front like you would like a road race car. Yeah, back there in the back. When, when you mean anti-Ackerman, you mean like the right front turns faster than the left front? Um, you could, but me as a manufacturer, I've built my stuff to where that couldn't happen. Like I, I don't give you that option to get to there. Now there, so there may be somebody else's cars where you could goof it up and do that. Yeah, that would definitely screw it up. Um, through my testing and trying to figure out where my spindles needed to be, there was a position where the right front turned faster than the left front. And that was weird feeling, is what I got told. So definitely worked on that to where we can't get the left front to turn slower than the right front. Yep. Yep.
No, you're referring to the dynamic gain, like the dynamic number or an attitude? So we're talking from ride height to full travel, like full travel, we're going to be at 18 degrees. So he's talking he's 18 at static. I've not heard nothing that big. Like you're, the inside at 18 degrees at static, the inside of the tire wouldn't even be on the ground really. Like we set our stuff at four and a half and through suspension travel, we'll travel four and a half inches from ride height. I'll go, we'll go to 15 degrees. That's where we end up at. So we'll start four and a half, end at 15. We still have half the tire on the ground. But another thing what you gotta remember too is chassis roll. Even that static number's there like that, the, the A-frame rolls out because most of those cars enter the corner with 10 degree of roll. So it's not the bigger number as what you think because it's the cars that 10 degree of chassis roll to start with. Yeah, I was actually in another seminar yesterday just listening and the guy said it the best and I keep for selling, forget to say this, the, the tires don't move, the chassis moves. And that's what Bubba's referring to is the 10 degrees of chassis roll. So yeah, like Bubba's saying, the lower sweeps out and the upper sweeps down. And man, we, I run shorter uppers compared to a lot of people and we get a lot of camber gain. Uh, some guys will start at five and a half, six maybe, and they don't gain as much as I do, but we all end at the same point. Main, main thing, the big... The uh, around, 15, around 15 to 18 is about a general number that you'll end up at. Say you're on jack stands checking it. And we do everything on pull-down rigs, so our numbers are a little different than what you'd do on jack stands. But And I, I don't... Do you do, and you might not do this, but how I look at an asphalt car <laughs> is our asphalt car, it'll, it'll enter the corner at 1.2 degree of chassis angle. So if you got your car, if you're looking at everything, you're going to look at checking the caster at the ball joint, which is a lot, the common way. The 2020 stuff isn't known as much as it used to be as far as sweeping it. So what we'll do is we'll put a car, we got on jack stands, we'll put like 14s and 12s. So then the chassis angle's at 1.2 degrees. So versus flat, if you're looking at caster flat, your dynamic, the spindle, the chassis angle matters on how much caster's in it because the car is actually operating not flat, it's operating at 1.2 on corner entry. So if you basically look at that, the long, the long or short of that is it rolls caster out of it, whereas you wind up with more caster in it, flat versus angle, so you kind of can pick it up. On the, on the caster, yep, yep. Yep. Yeah, but Bubba just elaborated on caster there real quick. So on my cars, we static caster, I'll be four and a half to five on the right front, just depending on banking on the racetrack, and I'll be two degree split. And like Bubba's saying though, it's, it's a big eye opener. When we get down to dynamic, I'll end up like 0.5 degrees of caster on the right front. But through chassis roll, you lose, I'll lose all my left front, but then I, that frees my cars up on entry to turn when that happens. I could try to crank a bunch in it to get it to be positive on left front when it was in dynamic and it just made it too tight. The, the old school way, the way us old guys used to look at cars, you need to look at stuff a lot more in dynamic <laughs> instead of static nowadays. You know, if you can simulate what that car sees, that's really the true numbers it's finding yeah, out we, there. We race it, we've changed it all. Years ago, everybody used to say, well, I check my car at static. I mean, I talk to guys in lower classes and they say, well, I check my car on my scales and I got this percentage, this wedge, this, this, this. Mike probably doesn't, but they, very rarely do guys today put their car back on scales after the first time. They know what all those numbers are. We look at everything at dynamic because that's where the car races. Our loads are at dynamic. You need a base, you need a base number, but everything else we just yeah. look at dynamic all the time. All right, where? Fellow here in gray? The, on the right front, I've got an older black bonded, and it seems like all the newer cars in the right front is at least 60 inches out further. Would that be something that would be beneficial to throwing that right front out further, like light wise, like what the newer cars are? Because it looks like half the right front is out of the box. All right, so his question is right front control arm links. So 
Yeah, your black front rocket car is probably 03, 04, so around in there. Short right front stuff, you're probably gonna be in the 17 and a half range. There's a lot of illusion stuff going on. Like the longest control of stuff we're gonna see right now is 20. So you could, you could lengthen that out. And what that's gonna do is that's gonna make that corner softer, let it roll up on itself easier. And it softens the spring grade essentially, makes more leverage, also makes the car steering better when you fuse to do that. So yeah, like we went through that same progression. Like our Warrior cars were 17 and a half, and then we went to 18, then we went to 19, went to 20, and then backed up to 19 and a half is where we're at right now. The illusion of the tires sticking out, it's what we're doing with bodies. It's, it's the noses, if you go look at all these cars in these shows, the noses are the same width. All of them are the same width. So I'll do it at the racetrack myself. I'll walk around the pits and see how much tire's sticking out past the nose. That kind of shows me if that guy's got a wheel spacer on or if he's really got a long lower, something of that nature. Um, with the rest of it where it's hanging out past the deck, that's all illusion and contortion with the bodies where we go to the wind tunnels and just try to get side force and stuff like that. But yeah, to your question, if you'll lengthen that right front suspension out, Lengthen the lower, but don't lengthen the upper. Keep the upper the same, space it out, get your camber correct, and you'll turn in them and run way better. Yeah, you'll see the, the car that you have is an older style car, kind of like what we had at the time too. Ran big front springs, the roll centers are really high, they didn't roll on the nose. So they used that short lower and all that stuff. Um, yeah, you can try to convert some of that. The issue you may run into after that though is the travel limitations of your cross member because you're gonna get down better, so you're probably gonna start bombing out, then you'll have to start looking at your final travel numbers and bump stop configurations and, and that and such. Michael? Uh, have you had any driver input when you, probably, I'm sure you have, when you check front strut versus rear strut stuff? Any, what's your driver input on that? I haven't fooled with it since 2005. Really? Yes. Now, I do know what other manufacturers' inputs are. Some guys like it, some guys don't. A lot of it is, is how hard the manufacturer has worked on making sure that the caster gain and loss on the right front is still good. Are you rear strut or front? Front strut. Yeah. Front it strut. Like, it seems like most of the late models, I know they, they all played with rear strut for quite a while. Longhorn did. It, I think everybody did. Yeah. And it seems now like you'll see some cars set up to go both ways, but you walk around and look at the guys that are all on the mail and they're usually all front strut cars right. right now. So the biggest thing there, like he's talking, he asked about front strut and rear strut. On a front strut car, when it swings, the lower swings up and we gain, we gain ca caster, which then when you back steer, puts traction to the rear end. If you do rear strut, the lower swings perfectly up and down. It doesn't swing in an arc backwards. Then you have to make sure when it moves that you keep a caster number the whole time so you can transfer a weight. Um, like Frank just said, like Longhorn went through a transition where the rear strut was the best thing to have and they were doing it for travel. And they got to a point where they were getting the cars on the aerial platform was amazing, but they were losing forward traction because they had no weight transfer. So then they had to work on the left rear to make them better. And then they just went back to start offering rear strut and front strut and let you kind of figure out, hey, what you want to do here. Then along came droop and no droop and what changed the arrow in the back and how much load was on it. I was just at Vegas and I walked around and I'm looking at the cars because it's a no droop rule. And I'm looking at it going, holy shit, the spoiler's up higher than the, up higher than the, the roof of the car. So it's just contorted bodies and stuff and how you can work the aero platform. Because remember, aero on these cars is really, really critical too. It, we generate a ton.